Okay, you can see up on the board here, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 20. It says, He who gives attention to the word will find gold, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. I think uh, in our own heads we feel that uh, he who gives attention to the word finds work to do, more work than I want to do, uh, finds criticism of uh, my lifestyle uh, and the simple things that I'm doing, finds uh, very, uh, uh, very hard condemnation on those who I'm related to uh, or who uh, I know uh, on the street or in work, uh, finds a lot of difficulties. And for that reason, uh, it's important for us to see that the proverb says that he who gives attention to the word will find gold. You might think all of those things are not gold. But at the end of the day, if they're used the way the Lord intended them to be used, God will come out of them. That's the point. Uh, not only good now, and there really is a lot of good that we receive by giving attention to the word in this life. We gain wisdom and understanding by giving attention to the word. We learn the pitfalls, and we learn to avoid the pitfalls in life that might lead us to death. So there's lots of benefits and lots of good that comes out of giving attention to the world, word even in this life. But we have the good for this life and we have the good for the next life as, as well. Uh, one aspect of the goodness is that you feel good about yourself because you're doing what is good. A lot of people are very unhappy about themselves. But when you're doing what is right, you cannot feel unhappy about yourself. Because that's a contradiction in terms. Everything that we do that is good boosts us, lifts us up, makes us feel better about ourselves. Everything that we do wrong, the conscience will condemn. And for that reason, we don't feel good about ourselves, and rightly so. But the good that we get out of giving attention to the word is very personal. And it means that I can live confidently, I can live with, uh, with uh, uh, self-approval, I can live before God knowing that I am, I am trying to be acceptable to Him in what I'm thinking and what I'm saying and what I'm doing. And so all of that is a great good for us. Right. And when he says, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord, I think the link becomes obvious in that verse. Those who give attention to the word are those who are giving attention to God. This is God's word. If we, if we give attention to the word, we're giving attention to God. And if we give that attention to God, we'll know who he is and why we should trust him. Because he cannot lie. He doesn't lie. It's, a, it's against his nature to tell us a falsehood or to lead us uh, astray in any way. Everything about him is righteous. Everything is holy. Everything is truthful. Everything is right. Everything is good. And for that reason then, we've found someone we can trust. You can't even trust yourself sometimes because of the fickleness of our nature and because of the weakness of our flesh. We can't Trust those who are near and dear to us all the time because they let us down. They are fickle and they are also weak in the flesh. Now we found somebody who we can absolutely 100% put our trust in and know that it will not be betrayed or it will not be undermined in any way. So you can see the intention of this proverb is to get us to see that we need to give attention to the word when we do, we will find God. That's the motivation for doing it. We always have to have a motivation. There has to be a reward somewhere. Otherwise, there's just uh, nothing there to motivate us. The reward is the good that you get in your own life and that others get because of your life and, that, uh, and the good that will spill out into our community and into this world. The, the blessing is that we trust the Lord. And the more we know about him, the more we can trust him. Look at Psalm 1. Psalm 1, verse 
<coughs> he says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Here's a person already convinced from giving attention to the word that the counsel they're looking for is good counsel, is God's counsel, is the counsel of those who are righteous. It is not the counsel of the wicked. How often our ears are open to those who are in the flesh and in this world, deeply rooted in it, and we are prepared to listen to those people before we're, able, we're prepared to listen to God. You'll hear Dr. Phil on people's lips, and you'll hear nothing about Jesus Christ, or the wisdom of Proverbs, or the writings of Moses. Dr. Phil said something, and therefore Dr. Phil is got to be right because Dr. Phil is intelligent, and Dr. Phil has great money, and Dr. Phil is getting the attention of the whole of America and the rest of the world. And Dr. Phil, who is Dr. Phil? Somebody who studied some books and put a little bit of stuff together, which he could have got out from the scriptures anyway. It's all based on scripture. Anything that's good that anybody has discovered, it's just they've discovered the goodness of God and through the intelligence that God has given them, they put two and two together to come up with some answers for the difficulties that we're facing in this life. But those difficulties are there in the word already and the res resolution of those difficulties is there in the word already. We wouldn't need Dr. Phil if we were listening to Dr. Jesus <clears throat> and his word. And he is the great physician. We think of him as the great physician. He goes on to say, you don't listen to the counsel of the wicked. You don't stand in the path of sinners. Don't hang around with them. Don't be influenced by them. Don't listen to their counsel. And we don't sit in the seat of scoffers, jeering everybody and everything that's sacred or that's good, like this present generation who seem to have no, just no idea of respect or understanding of what's good. It's just all do what you feel like and you're not answerable to anyone. But this person who avoids is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. In his law he meditates day and night. You say, that's a bit extreme, isn't it? No, it's not extreme at all. That's not extreme at all. What, do your problems stop at night? Or do they, do you not have any difficulties during the day? Is there not questions coming up all the time? Can we not then go to the Word of God and meditate on it day and night? And as we pray, can we not use the Word of God and the words of Scripture so that even our words are mediated by the Spirit? We're able to formulate the right words because God has given us the right words here already. If, you are, if your mind is marinated in the Word of God, what you've got in will come out. And what comes out will be acceptable to God. Here's how blessed you will be. This person will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. You ever see trees like that? Go on down the daughter and see the ones that are near the water. And see how well they flourish. And even in the dry seasons, they flourish because they're well watered. And you will be well watered. That's your reward for meditating on the word day and night. Well watered, even in the driest uh, and most barren times of your life, you will be well watered. It'll yield, you will yield fruit in its season. Your leaf does not wither, and in whatever you do, you will prosper. Whatever you do, you will prosper. Just think about it, brethren. Are they not good rewards? Are they not great blessings? Why are we fighting? Why are we resisting? Why do we feel it's such drudgery? Why is it that, that we have this wrong idea of our relationship with the Word of God 
when we should be absolutely open to it, delight in it, meditate on it, make it part of our thinking, part of our lives, exalt it whenever we get the chance. Because it is what it is. It's the Word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, mm. verse 10, we have this command from Moses, who is the author of the first five books of the Old Testament, the very foundation of the Word of God or the Scriptures um, was laid by him or by God through him anyway. And, and Moses commanded them saying, at the end of every seven years, at the time of the year of remission of debts, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place which he will choose, you shall read this law in front of all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, the men and the women and children and the alien who is in your town in order that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God and be careful to observe all the words of this law. Their children who have not known will hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live on the land which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. You can imagine this assembly. Uh, at the Feast of Booths. The Feast of Booths was a, a great festival for the Jews. It was a, a festival of real rejoicing. Uh, and uh, all the harvests were in. Uh, everything uh, was, was uh, all of their prosperity was before their very eyes. They knew they were secure through, through the winter now and, uh, and the unproductive months. Uh, so, so it was a great time of uplifting and uh, and praising the Lord for his goodness towards them, even in the material ways. But uh, the, then you had this remission of debts where uh, everybody who was in debt uh, was forgiven of that debt and the debt was cleared and the lands that uh, people had taken uh, were given back. Everything was, was back to square one. The slate was clean. You got a fresh start. It was a wonderful time. Can you imagine the burden that would be lifted from your, your shoulders? Now you have rid of those um, everyday problems. You have time to think about God. And that's one way the devil gets us. He loads us, and I mean loads us, with everyday problems. The cares, the riches, the worries, the pleasures of this life. They, they are all, he, he heaps it on us so that we haven't got time to think about spiritual things. We have not time to think about anything other than getting things done. And of course, the less time you have for the Word of God and for talking to God and <coughs> meditating and thinking about life and where you fit in and what you should be doing, it's bad for us. It's very bad for us as Christians <laughs> because it's deteriorating your faith. It's destroying your faith. I just want to make one, one point aside from this. Uh, these assemblies, the children were to be there. And the word of God was to be read out. And the children were to listen as well as the adults, the mothers and the fathers. Now you can imagine <coughs> the parents there with the children. And of course, the children, they don't want to be there. This is boring. The word of God being read out. And the whole of it, I must have went on for hours, <laughs> the whole of it would need it to be read out because uh, uh, certainly after Babylonian captivity they would have to uh, then interpret the Hebrew because they did, the people wouldn't uh, be that familiar with the actual Hebrew. They would have had to uh, interpret as well. So that would make it even longer. The kids are there and they don't want to listen. But I tell you, God said they should listen. And they should hear, and they should learn the fear of the Lord as long as you live in the land. That was what they were there for. Now when we bring our children to services, 
We're not bringing them to read comics. We're not bringing them to draw. We're not bringing them to be distracted by every, every different thing. We're bringing them before the Lord with us so that they can hear what we're hearing, so that they can learn something themselves, so that when we sing, they can sing. There's no question that a child can sing. Children love singing. But we won't impose that on our children. They don't want to sing. Don't worry about it. Why shouldn't we impose it? They're listening to the radios or their whatever iPods or whatever they, it is. They are able to ream off the words of pop songs out of their head. And not just one pop song, real reams of them. And they're able to quote it word for word, and they know what the meanings are. Which is very unfortunate, because the, the, that stuff is such rubbish, most of it anyway, such rubbish. So what, what we have now is, we, have, we wouldn't mind them singing in front of us, oh, we'd be clapping them, oh yeah, that's a lovely tune, oh, do the little dance for us, and they do the little dance for us, oh, we're so happy, our faces are beaming. Uh, but if they sang a hymn, <coughs> you'd be disappointed. And anyway, they wouldn't, because they wouldn't remember the songs of the hymn, or the words of the hymn. And I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is, look, we, we have a responsibility towards our children. I think the least we can do when we bring them to the Lord, with, to services with us, is to get them to see that we think there's something important for them to hear and for them to know. We think it's important for them to participate to the extent that they can and that they would behave themselves in a way that would facilitate everybody else's worship and that they would know that that's their responsibility to try and facilitate everybody else's worship as well. Just a small aside, but I think it just goes along with a certain type of thinking. There's a lax attitude on our part. And they pick up on it and take advantage of it. Of course they would. But we can correct that. It's easy to correct it. Once we see what God wants for us and for our children, he wants us to hear, he wants them to hear, he wants us to participate and glorify his name, and to the extent that our children can, he wants them to do the same as well. It is not brainwashing. You get atheists up on the television, children are brainwashed in religion. They're brought up with religion. Well, were you religious? Were you taught in the schools? Were you brought up with religion? Of course I was. Well, how is it that you're an atheist now and that you weren't brainwashed so much that you're still some sort of form of Christian? You had a choice. You made your choice. They'll have a choice as well and make their choice when they grow up. But for the moment, they need to know principles. They need to know what's right and they need to learn how to live with respect for other people and all those other things which is absolutely essential to the whole world's well-being. Now I've got off on the subject and uh, I think I didn't mean to go so far into it, but there you go, that's what happens in these lessons. <laughs> I'm talking about the Word of God <laughs> and the reason why we pay it such respect is uh, revealed to us in Isaiah chapter 40. says, this is verse 6 now, a voice says, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, <coughs> and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass <coughs> withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, for the word of our God stands forever. It's, it's interesting that the flesh is compared to a flower. And uh, in youth, truly, 
the flower of youth is obvious to see. Young people, for the most part, are beautiful. Just youth is beautiful. There's no question. It's wonderful. And it's a great time of life, full of hope. You, when you run across a problem, it, it's all going to be straightened out. There's hope. Things will get better. Our, our lives will be great and, and everything will work out perfectly for us. You've got all that hope in you. And uh, it doesn't matter what life throws at you, you can, if you're in love with somebody and they're in love with you, you can face the whole world together and everything will work out fine. It's a great time of life. There's a, there's a, it is one thing to accept where you're at in life and another thing to fail to realize that you're on a treadmill and that this flower of the grass will fade. <coughs> and if I'm putting my trust in my beauty, or in my strength, or in my wonderful personality, I'm making a mistake. I'm making a huge mistake. Because the time for all of this will pass. What would you do, young people, if you were in an accident? And suddenly you were totally deformed because of what happened in that accident. How would you cope then looking in the mirror? And what, what strength or inner strength would you have to, to help you to want to go on in life and to know that it's not the end, that things still can be done, that things can be achieved, that life can be good even under those circumstances? See, when you're looking at the fleshly outward form of things, it's very fragile and it's very temporary. You have to be a person that is more than what people see on the outside. You have to be a genuine person, a person of real substance, to match up with the beauty, that there will be an inner beauty as well as an outward beauty. And that if the outward one is lost, the inner one is stable. It doesn't, it never has to be lost, ever, for all eternity. We need to think along those lines. And that's why we pay attention to the Word of God. Because the Word of God helps us to be transformed inwardly. So that we're inwardly beautiful. And that's where the real beauty lies. Not in the outward form. So the Word of God by contrast to the glory of all flesh, will not fade away, whereas the glory of all flesh will fade away. As we said in the prayer, we get old, we get feeble, we'll die. That's reality. That's just all of us are going to have to face that. That's the reality. But when, before I die, if I'm on my deathbed, and I'm thinking back on my life. What sort of life would you want to have led when you're thinking back on your life just before you leave this life? What sort of person would you like to have been at that moment in time? Would you be happy with the way your life is going now? Would you be happy that you are the person you are now? and that you never changed, and that you never got better, that you became worse? Would you be happy with all of that? You know, now is the time to make those decisions. What, what I want my life to be, I'm deciding now. Do I want it to be righteous and good? Do I want to be kind and considerate? Do I want to be a, a, a genuinely nice person? Or do I not care? Am I selfish? Do I just want for myself? Is that all that's interesting for me? Where what I can get out of everybody else and out of life, what I can take and not give, is that what you want? Is that the lifestyle you're going to have? And do you think when you are on your deathbed and you're reviewing your whole life that you will be happy now that you're going into eternity, disappointed, disillusioned, and probably hated? Because you've given nothing to anyone. And in truth, nobody has given anything to you. The 
decisions like that are being made now. The Word of God abides forever, and the character that the Word will form in you will abide forever as well. <clears throat> All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All scripture, God breathed, comes out of his mouth. It is his word. Holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit to reveal his word to us. What we've got in our hands is the word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 13, for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of man, but for what it, it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. God's word has a work to do, and it will do it in the people who <coughs> believe that word and who trust God, who give attention to that word, who meditate on it day and night, who allow that word to guide them and to counsel them and to give them hope and to correct them and discipline them in every way that's necessary. Those are the people who know that this word is God's word and for that reason it is beyond everything else, just as God is beyond everything else. Because his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are greater than my ways. As, as high as the heaven is from the earth, so great are his ways to my ways. I'm trusting his wisdom. There's been a few interesting reactions to the word of God over the centuries. And I want to point them out to you so that you can see... Do you fit into any of these categories? First one I'd like us to look at is in Jeremiah chapter 42. <coughs> there was a remnant left after the Babylonians had captured Jerusalem. They were left in Israel and uh, we're told that they came to Jeremiah and said to Jeremiah, we think we're going to go down to Egypt because the Babylonians will come back and they'll take us away, they'll slaughter us or take us captive or whatever else. And they said to Jeremiah, you, will you pray to God uh, and uh, ask him what we should do? Um, look at verse 2. And said to Jeremiah the prophet, Please let our petition come before you and pray for us to the Lord your God, that is, for all this remnant, because we are left but a few out of many, as your own eyes now see us. That the Lord your God may tell us the way in which we should walk and the thing that we should do. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I've heard you. Behold, I'm going to pray to the Lord your God in accordance with your words, and it will come about that the whole message which the Lord will answer you, I will tell you, I will not keep back a word from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act in accordance with the whole message with which the Lord your God will send uh, you to us. Whether it is pleasant or unpleasant, we will listen to the voice of the Lord our God to whom we are sending you in order that it may go well with us when we listen to the voice of the Lord our God. Now, if you were talking to somebody uh, and trying to convert them to Jesus Christ our Lord, and they said to you, you just show me in the word of God what God says I must do, and I will be happy to go along with that, and let him be a witness against me if I don't go along with that. You'd say, great prospect. <laughs> I just can't believe it. I better not believe it either. <laughs> Because uh, Jeremiah comes back and uh, 
he tells them what the Lord says. And what the Lord said was, you need to stay here, I'll protect you. Basically, that was it. I'll protect you, I'll look after you. Look at chapter 43 now. Here, verse 1. <clears throat> But it came about as soon as Jeremiah, whom the Lord thy God had sent, had finished telling all the people all the words of the Lord thy God, that is, <coughs> all these words, that Azariah the son of uh, Hoshiah and Johanan the son of Korea, and all the arrogant men said to Jeremiah, You are telling a lie. The Lord our God has not sent you to say you are not to enter Egypt to reside there. But Baruch the son of Neriah is inciting you against us to give us over into the hand of the Chaldeans so that they may put us to death or exile us to Babylon. So Jehanan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces and all the people did not obey the voice of the Lord to stay in the land of Judah. Now what does that prove? It proves this, that when they came in the first place, they had made up their minds what they wanted to do. All they wanted was confirmation from the Lord of what they wanted to do. That's all they were asking, Jeremiah. You tell us that the Lord says we're right to go down to Egypt. You tell us that infant baptism is correct. Because that's what I believe. Show me from the word of God that God supports what I believe and what I want to do. We've got all sorts of different things that people believe and want to hear from the Word of God. But like Jeremiah, we can only tell people what the Lord says. And then what happens is the true feelings of their heart will come out as they hear what God says and it will be shown in their reaction to God's Word what they really are. These people were stubborn and disobedient and they never really wanted to do what the Lord wanted, except that what the Lord wanted was in keeping with their will. Are you like that? Do you get offended when you hear lessons that are saying things that, I, don't, I can't accept that, that just doesn't seem right. I, I, it's not what I think, uh, and uh, it must be, that, must, that couldn't be right. There has to be a way around this. You're looking for ways out, like some lawyer looking for uh, loopholes in the law so that you don't have to do what the Lord has asked you to do. There are too many people in this category, far too many, and there are Christians in this category as well. Because even though they've heard what the Lord says, they're just going to do what they are going to do. And that's it. All right, let's look at another passage I think would be uh, very helpful for us. Uh, Jeremiah, we're in Jeremiah, we're going to look at chapter 36. <clears throat> Jeremiah had made prophecies about what was going to happen to Israel. Uh, Jehoiakim was on the throne, he was a bad man very bad man. Uh, uh, Baruch had written down these prophecies and uh, some, some of the leaders uh, under Jehoiakim, uh, some of the princes wanted to hear what Jeremiah had to say. In verse 17 it says, they asked Baruch saying, tell us please, how did you write all these words? Was it at his dictation? Then Baruch said to them, he dictated all these words to me and I wrote them with ink on the, uh, on the book. Then the official said to Baruch, go hide yourself and uh, you and Jeremiah and do not let anyone know where you are. So they went to the king in the court, but they had deposited the scroll in the chamber of Elisha and the scribe, and they reported all the words to the king. Then the king sent Jehudi to get the scroll and he took it out of the chamber of Elisha, the scribe, and Jehudi read it to the king as well as to all the officials who stood beside the king. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with a fire burning in a brazier before him. It came about when Jehudi had read three or four columns, the king cut it with a scribe's knife and threw it into the fire that was in the brazier until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the brazier. 
Yet the king and all his servants who heard all these words were not afraid, nor did they rend their garments, even though El Nathan and Deliah and uh, uh, Jeremiah entreated the king not to burn the scroll, he would not listen to them, we are told. Now here's the violent reaction. The king hears the word of God, but is in his heart he hates what God has to say. And because it's just on a scroll and it's with people whom he's got control over, he grabs the scroll, he cuts it with a knife, and he throws it into the brazier to burn it. And I just believe with all my heart that if they, there are people out there who would do just that, do just that. I remember in, in the early days, my cousin had brought a Bible into his house, and uh, it was thrown out the door by his mother. But he could, uh, there, was, there was stuff from uh, the IRA, written material from the IRA. He could have that, but he couldn't have the Bible. That's how faithful people are towards the Word of God. And if they get a chance, they would destroy the Word and try to destroy the Word. There's, there's been, in history, there's been so many people have tried to destroy the Word of God. Thank God they didn't succeed. But that's how hateful people are. This Jehoiakim, do you think he could be brought into heaven? Do you think that heaven would be heaven if he was there and hated God's word to that extent? Do you think he doesn't deserve the condemnation that's coming upon him on the last day for what he was and what he's done? People like him, he had, he had a matter of months before he was overthrown by the Babylonians and yet he was behaving like it was all under his control and nobody was going to take anything that belonged to him away from him. When Paul was put in prison, Felix, who was the governor, used to like to hear the word of God. Uh, but he had it in his head because he had heard about Paul taking the money down to Jerusalem, a lot of money, and he thought, if this man's got a lot of money, maybe I can squeeze some of it out of him, you know, for the coffers uh, and from a political campaign or whatever it was. But he would call him quite often to hear or to discuss with him the word of all God, hoping he would receive some of this money. Now, when Felix's time was up, he left Paul in prison. He didn't release him. He knew he was innocent. He didn't release him. He didn't get his money either. So he, he goes off and leaves Paul in prison. And there are a lot of people who act, react to the word of God just like that. Oh, they listen to you and they might enjoy your conversations and enjoy being with you and enjoy hearing you talk about the word of God. But at the end of the day, they do nothing about it. Nothing about it. And, and the reason, they've got ulterior motives. The money was an ulterior motive for this man. All the people, all the people come to church for different reasons. Not necessarily so that they could honour God or be a better person. They'll come and they'll listen to the word of God for other reasons. Maybe they want company. Maybe they think they'll get some financial help. Maybe there's there's other reasons that they're they're coming. Uh, maybe they, they they just like the whole setup and they like the people and enjoy their company. But it's always, it, there's, there's always a selfish motive there, along with the uh, hearing of the word of God. And they end up like Felix, they do nothing, and they achieve nothing. We remember Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. Um, Paul talks about his own conversion to Agrippa, who was there uh, with Drusilla, his wife, And who uh, was asked to listen to Paul's case so that uh, there could be something written to him. the head man about Paul and, and why he should be sent to Rome and why he should, uh, should be tried in Rome. Okay. Acts chapter 26. <coughs> I'm 
I'm going to read from verse 22. So having obtained help from God, this is Paul speaking now, he's way, way into his lesson. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both the small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I'm persuaded that none of these things escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian, he says. <laughs> I don't think he meant it, but I think he was trying to uh, rip Paul about, what he, about his preaching to him in the way that he was, with such fervent earnestness. And, but Paul doesn't give up. He says in verse 29, I would wish to God that whether in a short or a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains, he says. Great, great, great. He just puts it on the line to them, regardless of whether they're jeering him or not. I would want you to become a Christian. I know that that's what you need to do. Whether it's in a short time or a long time, that's what you need to do. I want you to become like I am, except for the chains. I don't want that for you, but I do want you to become Christian. Do you think Agrippa ever became Christian? No record of it. He got his chance, but he, he was too into this world. Beautiful wife, Priscilla, power, uh, politically in the know and in favor. What did he want Jesus Christ for? What did he want the life of shame for as a Christian? <coughs> Sorry, let it go. <coughs> what about King Agrippa today? Would you like to be in his shoes, if he has any shoes on? <laughs> <laughs> Whose shoes would you rather be in? Sandals, maybe. Paul's or his? See, once it's all over, if, if you'd have been living at the time, you would probably look at Paul, look at the king and say, I want to be like the king. I want to have what he has. I want to have a good life. I want to have the best of all that I can get in this life. I want everything to be under my control. I want it all. And look at that poor fellow in, in chains, bedraggled. He's <clears throat> got nothing. <clears throat> but now that they're dead, it's like the rich man and Lazarus. When they died, who was the blessed one? Lazarus or the rich man? While they were alive, who seemed to be the blessed one? The rich man, of course. But let's all take all these lessons to the heart. We need to be like the Bereans. When they hear the word of God, let's look at it, Acts chapter 17, <coughs> verses 10 and 11. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That's what needs to be done. That's what needs to be done by all of us. That's the right reaction to the word of God. Study it out. Make sure it's right. And when you find out it's right, then do it. Change your life and conform to the will of God. Just by way of conclusion, let's look at Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Paul was at Ephesus. He didn't think he was going to see them again. And... His last wish for them and hope for them uh, was expressed in verse 32. Now I commend you, he says, to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. 
That's what the board is able to do for us. Don't miss out the opportunity you're getting. This is your life. This is your time. It will pass. It will be gone. One day we will not be here. What you decide today will determine what you are going to be for the rest of your life and will determine what your life has been after you've passed out of this life. You make the decisions now. And it's our job to conform to God's will so that we will have no regrets, but that we can live with joy in eternity with God through Jesus Christ our Lord.